type that keep it in the gear. So, um, we got to talking about income distribution the other day. We were looking at like the rents curves and talking about how the income is divided between the low income households compared to the middle income and high income households and that kind of stuff. Um, and then I was, I'm swinging back around to poverty again just to refresh your memory on what the poverty line is. That was a minimum amount of money income that a household needs in order to do the basics of safety and securing basics for food, clothing, and shelter. And for a household of one, that would be $12,140. If the household is four people, then you're, uh, that household should be bringing in $25,100. If you're bringing in less than this, you, congratulations, you're considered poor. Right? That's it. That's the definition of being, I'll uh, use work order. That's the definition of being poor is if your income is below the poverty line. The income is below the amount that they decide is necessary, basic for you to survive. And that's when assistance from the government is going to kick in. Because um, if you've got more than enough to survive and you're surviving and being happy, well, then any government aid would just be making you more happy. And the government ain't there to make you happy. All right. So, uh, just for some perspective, um, these numbers got them from 2016, which is from the Census Bureau. I don't know why it's actually 2016, not 2015. Okay. Uh, but as far as people under the poverty line, just so you know, um, all families, 9.8% of families are under the poverty line. It's one out of every 10. But if you break it down, families that have children living with them under 18 is 15% of those families. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. 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 This could be one, two, three, four, five kids. So that could be two, three, four, eight, seven, eight people in that, or four, eight, three or four, where a family could just be husband and wife, two, right? So, you know, there, there may be a bunch of two, two families in here, but the more ha families you have in, the more people you have in your family, the higher that poverty line goes. And then we looked at the fourth one. Uh, you know, uh, um, just a married couple only needs 16,000, but if they've got a couple kids in the house, their income needs to be 25, right? So that bar ends up getting higher there. Married couples, families, I'm going to come back. Five, only 5% five of married couple families. And married couple families with kids is only 6.6%. So what's going on here? I'll give you a hint. The difference between this and this is because of this. Single parent households. They are families, right? So married couple families, well, what's going on there? There's two people in there, and odds are both of them are working, right? Unless one of them has got a Mac Daddy salary to where the other one can stay home, right? So you're going to have two income families in most cases for married couples, and so whether they've got kids or without kids, two income households, you have two income households, both of you working minimum wage, guess what? You're going to need over about 25000 for having a couple of kids, right? So, there you go. so who's the families that are in trouble? Who's the single parents? Right here. Single parent households, where do the kids go? They go with mom, right? 95% of the time, 98% of the time. Junior go with mom, so families with female household or no husband present. Twenty six point six percent of them are under the poverty line. Having the kids under age eighteen living there, thirty five point six percent. Over one in three single parent households, single moms, their households is below the poverty line. Why? Yeah, why? Why? Maybe. Are, are they minimum wage workers? Why? Maybe. 
Why? No education. Why not? Because they don't have the time to go to Why not? Because the kids. Yeah, that's the, that's the problem. You got mom. When junior is sick, who's got to stay home from work to stay with junior? Mom, right? When who's got to? You know, I've got to get out of work at three o'clock so I can be home for when junior gets off the bus. Who's that? Mom, because there ain't nobody else, right? What about grandma? Unless grandma's willing to step up. If grandma happens to live in the same state, score, or the same county, score, but that may not happen. So a lot of times the single mother is going to be like, well, no, it's I don't have family support, so I've got to have some kind of job that I can start at like 9 o'clock in the morning and get off at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So you're talking, what, working five, six hours a day as opposed to eight? That ain't a full-time job, right? That's a lot of the problem there. Also, a lot of times uh, there's an interesting number of, you know, like the teenage pregnancies, where do those turn up? As Sam was alluded to, they don't end up going off to college, right? So it is very, 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 very tough to be a single mom out there. It is very, very, very tough to be a child of a single mom. And just to wrap your mind around that, I don't know why I'm going to go here, so we not just take this to the next step. She probably didn't go to school, to college, right? Guess what? Her kids probably aren't either. I think I've mentioned before, right? Maybe it was last semester, but there, there is a tendency for people whose parents went to college for you to go to college. But if your parents didn't go to college, odds are you're not gonna go to college either. I'm talking it's like it's like an 80-20 split. If your parents went to college, it's 80% chance you're gonna go to college. If your parents did not go to college, it's 80% chance you're not gonna go to college. That's kind of where the split is. And that's one of the things that's probably one of our number one missions here at Southside is beginning first generation people coming to college. How many of you were your first point in your family to go to college? Okay, one of you is admitting it, and the rest of you, okay. It ain't easy. And so, what's going to end up possibly being the fate of these people? An 80% chance these kids in these single parent households are not going to end up making it to college either. Because does mom have any financial ability to help Junior go to college? Probably not, because one in three of her is under your poverty line. Are y'all getting any kind of financial assistance from your parents in order to come here? They're not helping you with gas. They're not helping you with food. They're not helping you with laundry. They're not helping you with anything. So, overall, all, for all people, 12.7% of people are under the poverty line. Compared to 9.8% of families, 12.7% of people are under the poverty line. So what's that telling you? The families that are under the poverty line are bigger than the families that aren't under the poverty line. Right? The average, which we kind of have sort of seen this already, but the more people that you have in a family, the more likely it is for you to end up under the poverty line. Because the more kids you have, the more responsibility you have chasing down the kids, running after the kids, and it makes it harder to hold down jobs and that kind of thing. 18% um, of kids under 18 are living below the poverty line. That's what one in six. One in six kids is living below the poverty line. 9% of 65 years old and older. 9% of y'all's grandmas are living in the poverty line. That's one, one out of 11. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Odds well, are pretty great that one of y'all's grandparents. Ooh, ooh double, because y'all have got two sets of grandparents, right? At least one of y'all sets of grandparents from people in this classroom probably under the poverty line, just looking at the numbers. You look by ethnicity. White folk. 8.8% of white folk are under the poverty line. 22% of the African-American population is under the poverty line. 
19.4% of the Hispanic population is under the poverty line. Overall, there's more white people under the poverty line than any other group. Well, because there's more white people than any other group. Right? But percentage-wise, white people are less likely to go under it. Why? Because a bunch of racist crackers have run in the system and keeping everybody else down. Stupid honkies and things going on. I hate white people. <laughs> I'm not racist. I hate everybody. Y'all should go to that right now. What did I just tell you? 80% chance if you kick your parents went to college, 80% chance you go to college. If your parents didn't go to college, 80% chance you didn't go to college. How long have white folk in America been able to go to college? A couple hundred years. How long have African Americans in the United States been able to go off to college? Like three generations. And that first generation, you know, going back to the late 60s. Let's be, yeah, there's a few little colleges or whatever. Not really until probably by the time that I got born. And here. But, so what's happening there? And so, every American finally, okay, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 68, okay, y'all can go to college. But how many African Americans like, woohoo, score, and they're storming the gates of the colleges to come? No, because African Americans went out to go to college, African Americans first weren't going to college, and that kind of stuff. You go back and you watch films of what's his name, Wallace in Alabama, and that kind of stuff. What was all of that about? Like two people wanting to go to that campus. So when is it that African Americans really started getting, I don't know, serious about going to college? I don't know, in the 80s, like two generations ago. And as y'all know, people that have college educations, their incomes is going to be on average higher than people without a college education, right? That's why y'all are here, right? So white folk have had the advantage of getting the education and by extension, having the advantage of having the higher incomes to keep them above the poverty line. The system is sort of, okay, African Americans can go to college. Hispanics can go to college. Anybody, you all can go. It's just a matter of getting the other groups to say, yeah, I'm going to go. Even though most of the people in my community are going, I'm going to go. Recognize the value of it. And then we have things like affirmative action. I think I have a slide on it at this point. It's sort of to level the playing field there. To, let's just say, Just be honest, is it, who's it easier to get a job, a white dude or an African American dude? It's easy for a white dude to get a job, right? Does that suck? Yeah, but it, honestly, it is, right? So the point of um, affirmative action is to, well, if you've got a equally qualified African American candidate and white candidate, hire the African American candidate, because the white dude's got a better chance of landing on his feet. To go ahead and use it as a tiebreaker. Why do we do that? Because trying to make up for that advantage the white folks had. White folks started running a race a couple hundred years before African Americans and Hispanics were able to start running a race. We got a head start, right? Set aside slavery. Not even touching that, but just for education alone, white folks had that head start. And so consequently, white folks, on average, educationally, average income is going to be higher. It's less likely to be under the poverty line. But is it that simple? No. What's the other piece that I'm missing? Family size. Remember, we talked about the bigger the family, the more likely you are to go under the poverty line. Well, just in the different communities, there's a tendency for certain ethnicities to family size different. It ain't, it ain't nothing to see a Hispanic family that's got six or seven kids. When was the last time you saw a white family just walking around with six or seven kids? Not very often. My wife is one out of nine kids. 
Uh, the guys that did construction work were they, they, they were like JJ had twelve kids. But I mean every basically any other family that I know you can come to a church. Hispanics maybe have six or seven. African Americans have a tendency to have more kids than so family size is larger in some of these groups, which ends up putting pressure financially on them as well. I ain't saying any of this is right, I ain't saying any of it's wrong, I'm just saying that it is. And I apologize in advance if I end up accidentally offending anybody, I'm just I'm just telling them like it is. My 40 some odd years worth of life around here. So the transfer programs, many of the ones we have are geared toward helping those people below the poverty line. And so, most of the families that are going to be under there are going to be the single parent families. So, here in Virginia, for a family that has one adult and two kids, what's their financial situation look like? If you live out here where we are, Give me, the, no, don't. Give me the name of a human female. Susie. Susie and shit marks. Whatever. Susie and the kids. Oh. Susie. Susie lives here in the middle of South Side Virginia. Like the rest of us. Tana. Temporary age for needy families. We talked about that one already last week. Yeah. Temporary age for needy families. She would be getting an average check to cover her and the two kids, $546. Well, that's a maximum. The most she would get is $546 per tenth. Stamp, um, dude, I utterly blanking on what it stands for. It's like nutrition aid for kids, but the end is nutrition. 376 on average. Medicaid. She would qualify for health care, $835, well, that ain't money coming into her pocket, right? But that's covering her health care expenses, so she wouldn't have to be spending money buying health insurance, right? So that does help. It saves her from having to write a couple hundred dollar check every month. But that's worth up to $835 average. So their medical bill were like $1,000 and change, you see that big difference? Well, now this is the value of the premiums or her insurance coverage. This is what the state of Virginia is going to pay for Susie and her kids to have health insurance. So, what is the state of Virginia going to pay? At the most, $1,617, and half of that doesn't actually go into her pocket. Yeah. If she lived in Northern Virginia, well, they recognize that the cost of living is more expensive there, housing is more expensive there, all that kind of stuff. So they will bump her up to 727 for TANF, but everything else stays the same. So Virginia would be spending, call it $1,800 on her and her two kids. That's the cost to society, the state of Virginia, to us as taxpayers, every month for somebody like this. Even if she could cash out this Medicare, you're talking 16, 17. Multiply that by 12. What are you talking about? 16, so that's like $18,000 a year. That's a little bit above minimum wage, right? It's, it's, I mean, uh, it, it, it's above the property line, but you can't really count that 835, right? No. So. If she's expecting to live off of TANF and SNAP, well, you're talking like $800, $900 a month, plus her savings on not having to buy insurance. So TANF and SNAP alone, guess what? That ain't getting her to be above the poverty line. Living off of TANF and SNAP is living off of less money Susie would be making if she worked 40 hours a week at a part-time job. People that are getting the TANF, the old school retired uh, welfare, they're very aid for duty families. 89% of them also get the medical assistance of the government, Medicare, I mean Medicaid. 84% of them get the stamp, food stamps. 12% uh, get housing subsidies, and 8% get subsidized 
child here as well. So, yeah, it's kind of ugly. She has $800 worth of money for her and the two kids. But that's not all that she can qualify for. She can qualify for staff, uh, maybe some housing subsidies, maybe some child care, Medicaid. So it's not like, yeah, you know, we're going to give you some help, but it still ain't enough for you to survive. So we're just giving you enough to where you can be healthy until you go somewhere to fall over and die. No, it ain't that. But when you add these benefits together, her TANF, that was 500 some odd, the $300 worth of SNAP, health coverage, and then any housing assistance, that kind of stuff, it might actually add up to being about a poverty level assistance. The way we do our taxes in the United States, our income taxes, is an anti-poverty measure. Those people that don't have much money, we're not going to take much money from you. What percentage of your paycheck do you spend? How many of you save money every month? One, two, three of you. Okay, three and a half of you. So, okay, so half of you are not saving. So half of you are spending 100% of your paycheck, right? And the rest of you are spending probably 98% of your paycheck, right? So if Uncle Sam and Aunt Virginia were to increase your taxes, what's going to happen? Your spending is going to go down, right? Well, what about, I don't know, let's go back to Bill Gates. What percentage of Bill Gates' income does he spend? Not even 1% of it. So if the government came along and increased his in taxes, does that have change his spending? Not a bit. Because he's got plenty of leftover income that he's not using at the moment, and they're just taking away from potential future purchases when they're taxing Bill Gates, but they would be taking away from purchases that you are going to do this week if they raise your taxes and my taxes. So they, they, the government recognizes that because the government's like, okay, we can find it. We, we tax poor people and rich people alike. I don't know if y'all, Herman Cain, y'all know him? Uh, y'all know him from last week or y'all know him from 2008? Herman Cain, he was potentially going to be a nominee to be on Federal Reserve Board. That's where you've heard of him in the last couple of weeks. Well, he was a presidential candidate in 2000. Four, I think it was. And he came up with, he's got this 777 plan. There were people talking about a flat income tax. Everybody said pays the same rate. So the tax form would be a simple three lines. How much money did you make? What is the next percent of that? Send us the check. Just that simple. But the problem is, is okay, Bill Gates, what's his income? And he sent a check, no problem for him. But we be paying the same tax rate as Bill Gates. Maybe instead of right now, half of y'all didn't end up paying any taxes. Whatever you paid in income tax, you just got a refund check, or you should be getting a refund check in the next few weeks. Y'all did file any taxes last week, didn't you? Matthew, you're kind of looking around a little bit. You did each tax, right? Yeah. Okay, now, they, the money that you, they took out of your check for Social Security, no, you didn't get that back. The money they took out for unemployment, no, you didn't get that back. But the money that they took out for income taxes, y'all are broke college students. Your income is low enough, the government's like, we're going to give you all of that back because your income is so low, you, don't, you need every penny you got. So, low income families, you know, they're going to pretty much get all of their money back, or most all. But if the government says, well, everybody pays the same tax rate, well, we're going to take more money away from you, which means more likely you're more likely going to be below the poverty line, which means, well, we're going to take money away from you, tax, and then we got to turn around and give you a welfare check. So instead of taking money away from you in April and then giving you welfare checks throughout the rest of the year, what do they do? They just don't take it away from you in the first place. So you take home income isn't as low. That's, what the, that's why our tax system is progressive. As your income goes up, the amount of taxes is going to progressively go up to you as a percentage. If you're making less than like $14,000 a year, your tax rate is zero. And then it goes up to like 15% and until you get up to your income being like 60,000 or something like that, and then it jumps up again. And then, you know, if you start making like $300,000 a year or something, you'd be paying like 30% or something like that. But it gradual, it graduates. But then that's like the highest that it is. 
I don't know what the new tax rates are after they did the tax rate last year. I don't know. But otherwise, people would, you know, in this case, people with low incomes pay little or no income taxes each year because if y'all are paying taxes, then that's not like that much less money that you're going to have to spend on food and clothes. And when you're that broke, what are you spending your money on? Food and clothes, right? And if you build gates, where do you spend your money? Who knows, right? Sales taxes and property taxes are unfortunately regressive. They hit low income households more than they hit rich folks. Because when you go to the store, you're paying 5% on your purchases, right? Because that's what our state sales tax is. So, guess what? You, and how many of you spend 100% of your paycheck? Over half of you, right? So 100% of your paycheck, for those y'all, 100% of your paycheck is getting taxed 5% to sales tax. Whereas Bill Gates, he's only spending 1% of his money, so only 1% of his income is getting taxed to that 5% sales tax. So if you only had a sales tax, that's gonna hurt the low income people. Because it's taking 5% away from their spending power, but it ain't taking 5% away from Bill Gates, right? So your sales tax and your property taxes, they're going to end up being regressive because the people with low income are going to be coughing up a larger percentage of their income. So that's why you know, the flat tax ain't ever going to happen. And that's why we have, and I think I talked about this in Go one at the end of this month. That's why no, it's just three weeks ago we had to talk about the taxes and your sales and property. You know, just the idea there is what was I saying there? Uh, to short it ain't gonna happen because how many of us are in the lower middle income, whatever we're spending most of our almost all of our paycheck. So if we would go to a national sales tax, that would that would break us. And we wouldn't vote for the people that are trying to make that happen, right? Who would we voting for? People that are trying to get more money away from rich people, not more money away from us little people, right? So the national sales tax, never gonna happen. A flat tax, never gonna happen. Any politician that's telling you that, just change the channel. Or turn off the YouTube video because they'll watch you. Uh, the flat tax is it all. I already talked smack about that. Everyone's paying the same tax rate no matter what. It's simple, it's fair, it's efficient, but it is a bigger burden on low income families because it's taxing all of their spendable money. So, the math that I was aiming for at the end of the class to go to that. Minimum wage, somebody making seven and a quarter an hour, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year. So you get that long. $14,500 a year. Somebody making, bringing home just that social security check, $1,364 times 12 months, $16,368 a year. Ain't that big a difference. Somebody living off of the TANF and SNAP, that was what, nine, like $900 a month times 12 months? Less than a minimum wage, less than the poverty line. Ooh. Compare that fourteen thousand five hundred. Do I have on this slide? Yes. Score. The minimum wage fourteen thousand five hundred a year. The poverty line. The average household in Virginia is two point five four people. It's not that there's a half a person out there. It's just that for every family who's got three people, there's a family who's got two people, right? So it just worked out. So, the average family of 2.54 people. So, the poverty line for a three person household in Virginia is 20,780. Compare that to the minimum wage figure we just had on the last slide of 14,000. You have a single parent making the minimum wage with two kids. She's bringing home 14,000. She needs to be bringing home. Just shy of 21,000. Grandma and grandpa with their social security checks. What did I have here? Their social security checks, 16 and 60. If they both are worth 
full time wide receiver, six and sixteen, that's thirty two. They're going to be doing okay, but better than you know they'll be above the poverty line, but there's two that not super great. great. Yeah, and every time paying taxes and all that kind of stuff, so we're still in great living. A welfare family of three people, somebody that in Virginia, a three person household in Virginia, were qualified for five hundred forty six dollars. For welfare, three hundred seventy-six for food stamps, which is nine hundred twenty-two dollars a month, which is eleven thousand dollars a year. Plus, if you factor in the Medicaid of eleven thousand dollars a year for that, that's going to put them at twenty-two thousand dollars a year, barely above the poverty line. So, somebody, if you if you see somebody in the grocery store using food stamps, if they're barely above the poverty line. If they're fully qualifying for Medicaid, if they're getting food stamps, they're already getting TANF. But this is what we're getting Social Security living, minimum wage living, welfare living, about the same. But we saw these numbers in the other class, finance class, two weeks ago. The typical spending for a household, housing. Fourteen hundred seven, yeah, fourteen hundred seven dollars a month. Good night. That's uh, that's gonna be buying a that, that's gonna be payment on about a hundred eighty to two hundred thousand dollar house. A two hundred thousand dollar house. That's a pretty nice house here. What kind of house is that in Northern Virginia? Cardboard box. What kind of house is that in New York City? Yeah. Yeah. What kind of rent is that in a college town? Average household housing, $1,407 spending. Transportation costs, $750. That's going to include car payments, car insurance. Well, I don't know if insurance is in that one. Maybe two, door, no, two doors down. It's probably in that one. I can't remember where it would be. But gas, oil, inspection stickers, tires, car payment. Car insurance, $750. Maybe you got two cars, three cars. Two cars in the truck. Oh, food, $588 a month. Insurance, $466 and retirement savings. Uh, healthcare, call it $300. Entertainment, $217. That's buying video games, going to movies, even going out to eat instead of you know, the food. What, what are you doing with going out to eat? Yeah. I mean, going out for supper is going to be in that five food category, but then the alcohol that you consume, that's going to be falling in the entertainment category. Y'all don't do that because y'all are young. So there you go. Uh, apparel, clothing, education, 110, personal care, 520. That's including your haircuts and getting your nails done and getting whatever to dye the gray hair out of your hair and all that kind of what it's. I don't even know what all's in there. Miscellaneous. 256. Oh, and they said that vacation, that's going to be baked into the entertainment, that kind of stuff. If you add up your vacation, family, that kind of stuff. Average is out $4,755 a month. $57,000 a year. This is average. $57,000 a year spending. Living off of minimum wage, nowhere near it. Living off of Social Security, nowhere near it. Living off of welfare, nowhere near it. I'm usually a man to see how much brow you do. How much brow do they do? Yeah. I'm saying the typical man. Yeah, but how much? What? How many brow? I mean, how many money they do brow? Oh, how much money per hour to get that? Uh, it's 2,000 work hours in the year. So, what's. Fifty-seven is gonna be making about just shy of thirty dollars an hour, or two people working full time at fifteen dollars an hour. Stay in school. It's my job. Your parents call me Okay. 